Okay, so um, our next speaker is <coughs> Martin Wilkinson. Martin's been a Quaker since his teenage years and is qualified in materials science, sciences, thermochemistry and teaching. He taught science mostly in British state schools and briefly in Papua New Guinea for about 20 years before working for British Quakers to support local peacemakers in, uh, in Africa. Although his qualifications are not in social science, he's followed the work of his brother, Richard Wilkinson, co-author of The Spirit Level for the past 30 years. Since that book was published in 2009, he's been speaking about uh, economic inequality to 40 or 50 groups in Britain, South Africa, and Madagascar. Please welcome Martin Wilkinson. Well, there's a, let me see, I'm not used to a, a microphone. If you can't hear me, then wave your arms about and I'll try and improve. Because usually I talk to small groups and just use my voice. Anyway, here we are. Fantastic, I mean, really inspiring. I thought some of the things that David Dan said, some of his phrases, I would really like to have built them into what I say. And as for being as clear as, as Ben Dyson, that, that's a, a high aim as well. As we're in, in election time, you may be very bored with elections, but I'd just like to try something out on you, which I don't usually put in. Let's say a political party came along and made promises like that. Said, we have policies which will reduce infant mortality by a fifth, halve the level of obesity, reduce mental illness to one-third of the amount of mental illness at the moment, reduce the teenage birth rate to about a quarter, and halve the number of murders, you think they were crazy. But I'm not crazy, and nor are the authors of this kind of work that I'm going to tell you about, and yet that's exactly what they would claim for a long-term policy of creating greater economic equality. I want also to say that before the end of this talk, which I will need a signal to tell me when I'm getting a bit near, maybe you hold up a hand with five fingers when I've got five minutes. So I really want to get to the bit which connects with things which the zeitgeist movement believes is very important, the care of the planet, and I want to show how it connects up with that. Basically to say that the more inequality you have, the more pressure to consume you have, and it's consuming stuff which wrecks the planet. Conversely, the more equality you have, the more ready you are to understand other people, to cooperate, and to do things to rescue the planet from what's ahead of us. Okay, I know about this, as the introduction said, because my brother, Richard Wilkinson, has been working on it for years and years. He and Kate Pickett are epidemiologists, I have to practice saying that, epidemiologists, and it means people who study patterns of disease, but not in this case physical reasons for patterns of disease, but social and economic ones. So they've been together working for about 30 person years on this particular subject, and the work they present in that book which came out six years ago now, was not just a description of their work, but of hundreds of research projects by many dozens of different researchers. And I want to talk about it because I think we've got to a turning point in history where the quality of life is not improved by getting economic growth. Whatever the politicians say, they all say growth is what we want. It isn't. But it's improving the social environment in other ways, which I will explain. How good is our society? Well, we look pretty grumpy. That's, that's pretty standard. Things are not good. We have very high levels of mental illness, stress, people dissatisfied, unhappy at work. Did you hear Women's Hour? They had a program this last week about children getting more and more anxious, more and more worried about themselves. So it's going all the way through our society. Now, First, I'm going to show you a graph which is extremely, it appears to be very unhelpful to my argument, but it's true. And it says that within a society, the rich do very much better than the poor. 
So it's showing life expectancy, which varies according to different parts of Britain that you live in, from just over 71 to just over 79, classified by the local neighborhoods or electoral wards that people live in. And you see that the poorest, people who live in the poorest wards live on average to 71, or can expect to, and people in the richest over 79. Eight years difference, probably within a few miles of this building. And interestingly, it isn't only the poorest who suffer. You can see every group suffers in comparison with the one a bit richer than it. So this is a trend which goes all through our society. Now you might think, therefore, that if you compared countries, you would get the same thing. So that the richest countries, people would live longest. Let's have a look. True? Absolutely not true. There is no statistical connection between life expectancy, shown on the vertical axis, and gross national income per head, shown on the horizontal one. None at all. The country where people live longest is, by, is Japan, and that's from a long way from being the richest. And countries like Israel, which are among the poorest in terms of money there, and New Zealand and so on, people live much longer than they do, well, not very much, but because the differences are quite small. But there is no connection. Now, there are many things which we're more interested in than just living a year or two longer. We're interested in how well our children do at school, how many homicides there are, what's the murder rate, the teenage births, how much imprisonment there is, how much mental illness there is. Those are problems which crop up very often, and they're very important to us. And so Richard and Kate made an index of all of those, and they ranked countries, and then they plotted those fact, the, the index of all of them together against the gross national income per head. And you see, just as with life expectancy, there is no connection. Rich countries do not do better than poor countries. Nor can you say the other way around, there is no connection at all. It's a statistical non-connection. However, If instead of looking at the income in the country, we look at the level of inequality of income, plotted along the bottom, and the same indicator up the sides, we get an extraordinarily close fit, a very strong correlation indeed, showing that that index gets worse as income inequality gets higher. So the more unequal countries, USA above all, but also Portugal and the UK as the most unequal countries in Europe, the index is much worse. And at the other end of the scale, we get the Nordic countries and Japan, very different in other ways from one another, doing very well. And for a social science graph, you know, I, I studied physical science where points lie on graphs very precisely. But for a social science graph, that's extraordinarily tight fit. Let's have a look at the levels of income inequality in different countries. This is a very simple measure. It's just saying how much richer are the richest 20% compared to the poorest in different countries. And you'll see at one end of the scale, Japan and the Nordic countries, it's about three and a half times. The other end of the scale, USA, Singapore, and to some extent Britain, seven or eight times. In other words, we in Britain are twice as unequal as Japan and Finland. We can also look at how it changed over time. Taking from the late 70s up till a few years ago, we see that the really distinctive change happened in between 1979 and 1989 under Thatcher, and when inequality increased very much. Inequality in Britain in the 70s was about the same as it is now in the Nordic countries. And there was a dramatic change. And it was a change that was quite deliberate. I'm not sure that Thatcher said, let's create inequality, but there was a definite change of political 
ideology and a great many measures such as weakening the power of unions and lowering high rates of tax on the rich that produced that effect. It's interesting to look particularly at the top pay, where the changes are even more dramatic. This is in the United States, but the same sort of patterns have happened here. We seem to be led in many ways by the United States, just as during the Reagan-Thatcher era, the two went together. And we, if we look at how much did the bosses earn, the bosses of the really big companies, compared with their ordinary non-supervisory workers. And we'll see that back in the 1970s, they earned... No, I don't want to use the word earned. I want to say paid. They were paid. Because earned suggests people deserve something. <laughs> and I don't think that necessarily applies. OK, all the way through 1965, 70, 75, 80, um, about 20 times as much. And now, in the last 10, 15 years, a variable amount, going up and down a bit with the stock market and so on, but Roughly, they were paid something like 200, 200 times, going up to 400 times as much. So things have changed dramatically. We tend to accept things as they are, but actually, they don't have to be like that. They weren't like that. They weren't like that when I was young. Uh, so, you know, things are really different. Uh, just so as you have another index of... Uh, social variables, people's health and happiness and welfare and so on. There's an index produced not by Richard and Kate. Sometimes people say, well, they produced the index and it was carefully chosen to fit their theories. This is one produced by, the, uh, by UNICEF, part of the UN, and it says child well-being. In this case, better is at the top and worse is at the bottom. And you'll see that the more unequal countries, measured on a thing called a Gini coefficient, will like which I can explain, but only if I'm given a moment in private, not too quickly now. Anyway, the more unequal countries do worse. The last time this was measured before that, the UK was bottom. We seem to have moved up a bit, but we're still pretty poor. Um, I need to skip very quickly through a few things, a few of those separate variables that occur on the indicator. So, People in more unequal countries trust each other less. Below 20% in some cases of people say, I, I on the whole feel I trust other people. Whereas in some countries it goes up 60% or so say, yeah, I can trust other people. I'm just about to go to Sweden for the first time and I'm looking forward to seeing whether it actually feels different. Here's another one. As well as just comparing countries, Richard and Kate have compared the states of the United States and put in the same graph the provinces of Canada. And this is an indication of how many homicides are there per million people. And you'll see that on the left, the more equal states have homicide rates of down as low as 10 per million. And on the right, they go up to 150 per million, 15 times the rate of murders in the same country, same political system. Imprisonment rates. This is a log graph, and so it looks, it's actually more unequal than it seems. Um, huge differences in the numbers of people in prison, from 40 per 100,000 up to 400 per 100,000. USA leading the way. I feel quite embarrassed because the USA comes out so often, I'm embarrassed when I meet my American friends because there are so many good things about that country, but they think everything is good about that country and I'm afraid to say they are entirely wrong. <laughs> Here's another one. You see mental illness here, we and the USA. Now, this is how many people in the last year have had an incidence of mental illness and it comes out, goes up to about a quarter in our country. That can be just depression, something like that, just depression. Whereas in other countries, it can be as low as 10%. Two and a half times the rate of mental illness. If we could track ourselves down that line towards the left by reducing income inequality, that's why I say we might be able to reduce the, the level of mental illness, the incidence, dramatically in this country. 
Sometimes people say, well, perhaps these benefits from being in a more equal country come just because there are fewer poor people. It's not only the poor who benefit. Now, to prove that is quite difficult because you have to divide people into class groups in different countries, in, here in this case Sweden and England and Wales, and you have to make sure the class groups are classified in the same way, which is difficult, and everything is measured in the same way. But let's have a quick look at this. This is infant mortality, and we see that the lower the occupational class in Britain, that's the red ones, the higher the infant mortality. And there's a steep slope between correlating with um, infant mortality and the lower the social class. In Sweden, the blue ones, there are two things to note. One is that there's very diff little difference between social classes, and the other is that every blue line is shorter than every red line. In other words, in every single social class, including the highest, the Swedes do better. And I could show you the same graph for adult male deaths between 16 and 64. Well, why? What is it that explains how all these different things seem to be affected by fairness? I wish I could show you what you get if you put into your web browser those words, monkey, cucumber, grape. Does anybody know? It's hilarious. <laughs> it, it, it shows um, monkeys being given cucumbers or grapes according to what they do. And the monkeys object wildly when they get what they think is not the same as the other monkey is getting. So what, I, what this suggests to me is that the suggestion of fairness and equality is written right into our, certainly our culture and possibly our DNA from even before being human. It's well worth a look. And it only occurred to me recently, um, I heard somebody reciting a bit of the King James Bible when there was a centenary a few years ago, I mean a multi-centenary, and Cain and Abel. Do you remember, it says, it is about respect and violence, which have a very strong connection. Disrespect leads to violence. On the streets of London, you might hear somebody saying, he dissed me, that's why I hit him or stuck a knife in him. Well, they knew it. However long ago Genesis was written, they knew it then, because it says that Cain, the, the Lord, it says something like, the Lord did not respect the offerings of Cain, and he did not respect Cain. And then the next verse, it says Cain was extremely wroth, and then a couple of verses after that, it says he killed his brother. So, equality and respect and so on are very important issues to our health and also to our behavior. I'll just remind you about all those different things that go with greater equality is better and greater inequality is worse. Some people think it only matters that the only serious matter about inequality is if it produces poverty. But actually, inequality brings out much more in our, in our psychology. We have a choice often of how to live together. Are we going to compete? Are we going to cooperate? And the more inequality there is, it seems to bring out these ideas of dominance and subordination, superiority and inferiority. It increases our anxiety about who we are. If there are big differences between us, it matters much more. If you think I'm rubbish and I'm doing a bad job, that's really difficult for me to take. If I feel respected and approved of, then I feel better. And that affects me physically. Issues such as this. Do people see me as a success or a failure? Do I feel respected or despised? Do I have or can I afford the things that signal success? Now, if we lived in a simple society in a village, we might know each other by that chap grows the best carrots in the village and that chap sings tenor wonderfully and that chap's enormously kind to his neighbours. But that's not how we live. We live in societies where we look at each other and we see from the handbag this person is carrying or the car that that person's driving or the status of the job that they have 
that's their status. And status matters very much. We might wish it didn't, but, but it does. And it has an effect on us. People know that health is a matter of psychosocial factors as well as physical factors. So if you have low <coughs> social status, it actually makes you more likely to be ill and it makes you more likely, uh, less likely to recover rapidly. And weak social connections, you can actually try sticking cold germs into somebody's nose and see how, whether they get the, the cold or not. And you find that people who have more loving connections with family and friends are less likely to get the cold. And you can scratch their hand and see how quickly it heals up, and the ones with more social connections and more loving relationships heal faster. So we are affected. And this goes even to our life before birth. So if a mother is stressed, that has an effect on the baby, and the, the baby's genes are not changed. You can't change the genes, but you can change how they're expressed. And the, the baby emerges in a different state from it would have been if the mother wasn't stressed. The things which cause stress most are things where we feel judged. If I asked one of you to do a long division sum and we were just sitting together in a cafe, that probably wouldn't be hard. If I said, do one now in front of everybody here, you might feel, I, I, I'm not quite sure about how to do that. If I said, here's a television camera, it's live, it's going out worldwide, that would be really stressful and that would produce hormones in your body. Now, some people feel stressed like that all the time, and it's very bad for us. A bit of stress is good in short term because it makes you able to talk fast. My wife says I talk very slowly, um, but I don't, I hope, when I'm here because there's a bit of stress, and good thing too. Helps you to run away from the saber-toothed tiger as well. But long-term stress is very bad for you because it diverts the resources of your body away from repairing and building your body and towards the things that you need to deal with the crisis. And some people feel the lower down in society you are, the more likely you are to feel that you're in perpetual crisis. Now, I want to come on to inequality and sustainability. One of the ways we support ourselves when we feel stressed, when we feel worried about our status, is we buy stuff. We've heard about retail therapy. Well, that's exactly it. People buy stuff to show other people that they're successful, to feel strong in themselves, to reward themselves. And the more stuff we buy, the more we wreck the planet, basically. Conversely, if we need to rescue the planet from the direction it's going, not just with climate change due to carbon dioxide and methane, but using up the water supplies of the world and the resources, if we're going to reduce that, we need to cooperate. We need to think of one another. We need to behave differently, make little self-sacrifices. And so those things all happen better in more equal societies. If you're in a very unequal society, it's, it's very difficult to have good and close relations with other people. You go off into your gated community or you feel ashamed to go into the same place as somebody else. Working hours are much longer in more unequal countries. It's a rather dotty graph because it shows separate years rather than averaging over years. But you'll see that the countries down on the left, like Norway, working hours per year go down to about 1,400. On the right, they go up to about 1,900. Difference, 500 hours a year, 10 hours a week, two hours for every working day. Astonishing difference if you think of the, the liberation that having an extra two hours would go. Or you could take one hour a day less and have a good holiday, have an extra month holiday. That's what's possible. That's what people are doing now in different countries where it's more equal. And in a place like Britain, which is more unequal, people at all levels of the social scale are likely to work longer. People at the bottom, because they feel they simply must to to earn enough to live a decent standard, and people at the top because perhaps 
if you are working in a big banking firm, maybe it's macho to stay on. You know, you're a wimp if you go home before nine o'clock in the evening. So more equal societies are more cohesive, have a stronger community life. They recycle more. They go by bike more. They produce less CO2. They want their governments to apply with international agreements, and they give more of their income in, in aid. How do we get to greater equality of incomes? Well, we could go what I nicknamed the Swedish solution. We say, it doesn't matter how much people get paid at the beginning, we'll reduce the income differences by having lots of benefits at the bottom and high taxation at the top. Now, that works after a fashion. It has two disadvantages. One is that if somebody's being paid 10 million, it's not very easy to reduce him to, say, 200,000. Somebody who's better at the arithmetic than me will work out that it'll be, you'd be taxing him at about 95% or something like that. And nobody would probably accept that. The other thing is that if a government comes along and says, OK, we'll produce that, the next government can come along and reverse it perfectly simply, just by having a common majority. Or you can have what I've called the Japanese solution, which is that there are smaller differences in income before tax. Now, that may be better if we can get to that, because it does reflect a sense of equality more, and it's less easily reversed. We think that the workplace is the best place to really make a difference, for lots of reasons. The status of our job is very important to us. Somebody's position in society is very largely determined by what job they have. Our power and position at work, people spend a lot of time at work every day, every week, and that's where they experience power differences. Okay. And our income and spending power derive directly from our work, so that's where we need to address it. This is a little graph, which I'll show you very quickly. Um, we see the top graph is income difference, and it's highest at the beginning, and then it dropped in the middle years and then went up again, and it's exact reverse of trade union numbers, numbers in trade unions. So when trade unions are strong, income differences seem to be different. How could we get there? Some policies. Well, Economic democracy would turn companies from being pieces of property into communities, and we think it could reduce pay ratios and transform the experience of work, redistribute wealth, and improve productivity. And these are measured facts about more economically de democratic companies. There are lots of them, and quite a lot of different models. And here there are some suggestions as to how a government could influence our workplaces to make them more democratic and move in a, towards a more equal society. I think I have to stop. Okay, thank you very much. We'll just take a, uh, we'll just take a couple of um, questions, but... I actually wrote down um, a couple of things of my, my own, just as I, a couple of observations I, I made during your talk. Um, a few things that people should try to check out when they get time. You mentioned respect and violence, and there's some very good work by um, a Harvard sci uh, prison psychologist, James Gilligan, exactly. who's, who's worked with some of the most violent offenders in the prison system in America for 30 years. So if you have a chance, check out the work of James Gilligan. Also... The other sort of uh, shame, respect, and what equality can deliver it into what people often say is, well, we're naturally unequal equal and we're competitive and things. There's a very uh, likening that to chimp studies. Uh, the work of Robert Sapolsky yeah. is very worthwhile checking out as well. Um, for, for just briefly, one, one example is in a baboon troop that exhibited all the usual competitive tendencies that you'd expect in, in uh, those type of troops for years and years and years. Um, a, a, I think it was tuberculosis hit, the tr hit that particular troop and when it did it, it killed off the alphas 
and the rest of the chimps remaining in that troop decided to be more egalitarian with their behaviour from that day on, and any new, ch new chimps coming in who tried to exert their dominance were quick quickly found out how this new, tri this new troop worked, and it's remained that way for 15 or 20 years, S and it's not changing. So, it, you know, because people say, well, you see it in chimp troops all the time, and that's us, we're just, you know, we're, we're monkeys. And stuff. Okay, fair enough, we are, and there's your evidence why that, that's a very interesting study. Um, I, I could I could uh, I could go on because it raises so many different things. One one more, just uh, if I may. Sorry, I'm, I, I know I'm grandstanding, I, I, but um, the Dutch Hunger Winter. Is everybody familiar with that? Is anybody not familiar with the du Dutch Hunger Winter? Well, it's worthwhile for you then. Okay, um, the Dutch Hunger Winter. Basically, uh, the Nazis in uh, in them exiting um, uh, Holland in the uh, late stages of the, the war. Basically, they, they took all the food supply away from the Dutch people. Women in their second or third trimester of pregnancy during that time obviously um, went without food, and so did their, 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 uh, their babies, who, who were then born. And chances being, and I think it was about 90 or 95% of all of those babies born grew up to have diabetes, strokes, heart, heart, prob heart problems, weight issues, because their, their genes changed to be forever really stingy with their sugars and fats because they, they, they changed in preparation for the coming environment. So what you were saying about effects in, in neutro, um, because people, people will pull out things like the twin studies, for example, and they say, well, these twins look quite similar, but you've got to bring it right back to, you have an environment the minute you have an environment, and that begins in neutro. So... Uh, I think that's an important thing to mention. Apologies for grandstanding there, but I just it brings up a lot of interesting oh, insights. So could we have some questions, please, from the floor? Yes. If um, um, I have actually two questions. I would like you to relate to, question, to um, uh, issues regarding like uh, economic, social values, uh, religious and cultural values um, regarding first the migrant who come to Europe in terms of reducing inequality here in Europe, but at the same time you have like many migrants who like to come here and, and integrate in Europe. And the same question, the same uh, would be um, in regards to how do you think um, the religious extremists, for example, many times in UK or Germany or Spain, um, can affect this process that looks very nice on paper and on statistics of reducing inequality when they have other values that might be conflicting with inequality like religious values um, that is very difficult to making, uh, you know, here, right? You have many, uh, for example, uh, you know, contraception classes in schools and many religious issues conflicted with that one. Okay, I'll take the second one first. I yeah. find that easier, um, perhaps because I am a sort of religious person myself. I say sort of because um, Quakers' religion is to some extent homemade and self-made. And I think that all religious, all the main religions, grope towards truths. Um, our first speaker today spoke about fundamental truths of, in society. And I think that religions have tried to seek that out. And if you look around religions, Christianity is the one I know best, it says that people are fundamentally equal. We are of equal value. And that's the essential thing. Um, now, there may be particular groups where religions have made pronouncements about what they feel about people who have same-sex attractions, something like that. Those seem to me to be extremely important for the individual's concern, but entirely peripheral to the religion, not the central message of the, the religion itself. And I think the Archbishop of Canterbury would support that, perhaps the, post, the Pope too, if he allowed himself a little bit of freedom. Question of immigration. Um, not a thing I've thought about a lot, but I think the more different our society is, the higher the steps there are between one part of society and another, the more unequal it is, the more difficulty people have in fitting into it. So they sometimes talk about some of the effects of the different states which I showed you as perhaps being to do with whether there are black or white people, whether society is united or not. But I think blackness is not of any significance at all, except in as much as it demotes, it suggests respect. 
in, this, in our particular societies, it's unfortunately become true that there's an association between class and respect and so on with race, which is, to my mind, entirely wrong, but it's there, and so it's, it's difficult for people to fit into a society. But the more equal societies, uh, I think, are better at accepting people, uh, whether people from a different class or a different race. <coughs> and Sweden has taken a great many pe people of that. Um, a, a lot of immigrants, many more than we, I think, proportionately. Yes? It does really highlight the, uh, the, the, the problem of inequality in society. Yes. You see, it's, 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 it's not just money that's a difference, it's everything. Anything, anything that gets people to, to prejudice, to just uh, not bother thinking anymore about whether they're dealing with an individual, just class them in the groups. That's why you've got money. That's why, that's why all the uh, state officials have fancy cars and stuff like that. So people don't have to think anymore who it is. It's obviously someone in a fancy car means there's someone important. And that's, that's the problem people have got. If you, if you continue to just use these really too... too uh, low-grained ways of dealing with our people in the world, then what you expect? You're going to have a problem because the world life is a lot more finely grained. And obviously, again, the point of the immigrant thing is, you know, I like, love and respect all our uh, friends that come over in the state. And um, also, you know, the ISIS stuff. Maybe, yeah, <coughs> it's about the same quality. Sorry, have you got a question? No. <laughs> Okay, no. well, I, I, I'm, I'm right with you that it isn't basically about money. Money is an indicator to ourselves of, of our status. It's a comforter for our status, and it's an indication of how society values us. And the more equally it is distributed, the less worrying and difficult it is. But I agree, the fundamental thing is about the respect and attitudes we have to one another and not how much money we make. It, it, it perpetuates, I, I think, the other effects. Is that? Yeah, I, th I think I, I think you make I think you definitely make a sound point. Um, so we'll just go to this side of the room. Take a question from over here, please. Try, do try and make it brief because we we need to go to lunch then. Uh, what are some small actions that you would recommend to start immediately to break certain habits that sustain inequality, like on an individual level, not policies or rules, but just habits, like personal habits. Like when you're walking down the street and you see somebody who's not got access to a certain good, what, what kind of habits would you recommend okay. to help with that? Well, remember, remember what it's all about. It's feelings of respect and disrespect, feelings of being valued or not valued. Now, you can indicate to somebody if you value them. There's a very strong bit I could get you to read from the Spirit Level book, which is about a man in Rotherham coming in to sit down in a social services waiting room and a very nicely dressed woman comes in and he feels absolutely terrible. And he describes it and he starts to swear and he says he feels he shouldn't be there and she's thinking that he's crap and he gets all sweaty and he's too, he says he's too fat. And, and you think, she didn't know that. She didn't know that she was having that effect on him just by how she looked and how he thought she was a different class from him. And perhaps if she'd said hello to him, it would have made a difference. So I think talk to people on the bus, you know, smile at people, connect with people. Also, I think we should avoid spending on things which are ostentatious. If I come into a place and I've got a, a suit or a handbag or a car, which hardly anybody else can afford. I'm saying, I'm different from you. I'm superior to you. I think we should avoid that. I think we can also act a bit on the, the wider social scale by saying, which organizations that we could possibly deal with are fostering inequality? I took my money out of Barclays when I heard that the boss of it was being paid 10 million quid a year. And they were corrupt. I mean, Barclays, I've been told today, by someone who works for them, uh, of their corruption. And I tried to put it into something that's more mutual. So I tried the nationwide. I then discovered that their boss was paid <laughs> 1.7 million, and the person in the branch where I enrolled thought that he was paid 70,000. She genuinely did. I had to show her the annual report. 
So I think we need to know about companies. If you think that the John Lewis model, the partnership, is good, then do your shopping there. If you think that co-ops are more democratic than another kind of company, or a small local shop is more democratic, then do your shopping there. You can use your power. And make sure that you know about this stuff. If you look up Richard Wilkinson, TED Talk, you can get 16 minutes, the whole theory of the spirit level book without reading the whole book, but of course I encourage you to do that. <laughs> and I would encourage you also to read a little book that came out, produced by the same authors, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, called A Convenient Truth. And The Convenient Truth is, you can get it free online from the Fabian Society, is that the same thing we need to save the planet is more equality. And that's the same thing we need to have a happier society, more equality. And what we don't need is growth. So we could get to a state where we had shorter working hours, more leisure, and, and know that we were looking after the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, okay, just a, a couple of notes before we take a break for lunch. Um, there's some flyers on your way out to the right. If at any point during the day, especially at the end, obviously you want to pick those up and uh, spread them around on your travels, please feel free. Also, in case I forget to mention it, there's some sheets to sign up for uh, the movement where you might feel you might want, wish to be involved in that. That's obviously coming a bit later. As well as... Um, Hopefully our speakers are going to remain with us uh, for the rest of the day, if possible, so that you can um, have a conversation with them either over lunch or, or near the end or in the breakout session. Um, so I think we're going we're gonna to break for lunch now. If we can arrive back prompt at uh, 5 to 2, we're going to get started. We are running about 20 minutes behind at the moment, but if we come back then it should be all good. Thanks very much, everyone.